I'm Lucy Green and I'm a space scientist working at University College London's Mullard Space Science Laboratory. The Mullard Space Science Laboratory is the UK's largest university-based space lab and in this building we have around 180 people who are doing not only scientific research looking at things like black holes or galaxies, star formation or the sun which is my specialist area, we're also building the instruments that we need to be able to do this research. Everything happens on this site. My new book is called 15 Million Degrees and that's in reference to the temperature at the centre of our local star, the Sun. And really in the book what I wanted to do was convey just how far we've come in understanding our Sun, but also the work that it's taken to get there. So I wanted people to get a sense of what the real Sun is like, so to move away from seeing the Sun as perhaps a placid disk in the sky that we completely take for granted and transform people's views so that they see it as this violent and dynamic object that it actually is. And the sun really is our friend and our foe at the moment. So we rely on the sun for the energy that we need to survive. But what we've been seeing in the recent decades is actually that the sun can cause problems on the Earth, in particular to our technology. So there's this new area called space weather, which is all about how solar activity, so the violent side of the sun, how that then can impact us here on the Earth through things like causing problems to our satellites, changing the conditions in our atmosphere or causing problems to electricity networks. And so there's a, there's a lot of science in the book but there's a lot of history as well. And what I've tried to show is that to get to this point it's taken us 2,000 years of naked eye observations of the sun, which I should say don't do because that's extremely dangerous to look at the sun without any specialist filter. And then it's taken us 400 years of observations using telescopes, and 400 years of bringing us towards modern science and then also 60 odd years of using space instrumentation to study the sun. So it's been a huge, huge feat and a lot of that has happened in the UK. So there's lots of UK stories in there as well. I first became interested in space as a teenager and I think in fact it grew naturally out of an interest in physics. So at school physics was always my favourite subject. I really liked having a framework around which I could answer questions. So I was always interested in looking around me and wondering why do things work out the way they do and so physics gave me a framework to be able to tackle questions that I saw around me but that decision to do astrophysics with physics was actually because of a comment from my parents who said oh have you thought about astrophysics and I, and I thought to myself well actually I don't really know what that is so I started to read into it and look into it and realised that actually yes the universe as a laboratory to do physics was what I wanted to investigate and so I started off doing astrophysics and then I narrowed into studying the sun. When it comes to role models I think I've probably had different role models at different points in my life and I think first of all definitely it would have been my parents because they were both working in um, technical areas and so seeing my mother working in a technical area as well as my father meant that I didn't see any gender difference and also I went to an all-girls school so there was never any subjects that were the subjects that girls did or the subjects that boys did but then when I came to do research in science and particularly to do the PhD that's when I found a particular female role model that just sort of came about organically actually she just happened to be really inspirational really interesting and interested woman and getting to know her, we just sort of started this informal um, uh, mentoring, I suppose, and support, and actually that's carried on throughout my career. So if we come round here, these are our mechanical workshops, and this is where we build instruments that go to visit the Sun, Mars, Venus, and more. So come in and have a look. Here we have the bits of kit that allow us to take our designs of different instruments that we want to send into space and we can start to cut them up, cut into the metal, have the instruments take shape and start to do the build of the instruments here as well. Now, the job's not complete once we've done that because we still need to test the instruments before they go into space to make sure that they are going to withstand the space environment. And for that reason, we always make different models for the instruments. Um, that we can do different tests on and we've got some of those models through in the other section. So this is a model case of the camera that we're going to be sending to Mars. This is called PanCam 
and it's a stereo camera so it's going to be able to give us a sense of depth and perspective on the surface of Mars uh, in the same way that our eyes do actually so it's, it's a stereo camera we have two eyes and this camera also has two eyes so we've got one eye over here and then one eye on the other side and then inside this is where all the electronics and all the optics will sit we've got filter wheels that will sit behind each of the two eyes so that we can take images in different wavelengths of light that will tell us about um, the rock composition and changes to the atmosphere but the most important thing really or an important thing is that this camera will be the eyes of a European Space Agency rover so this camera will tell the rover where to go and it will also provide information for a drill that's on the rover that's going to drill down to a um, maximum of two meters below the surface of Mars looking for signs of life and this is a British-led camera so it's nice to think that the British-led camera will be giving the first images from the ExoMars rover. And then a bit closer to my interest area is um, the Solar Orbiter mission and we've got some bits from Solar Orbiter here as well. We're very keen to explore everywhere in the solar system but for me, the sun is the centrally most important object. And what we really want to do in the future is get up close to the sun and be able to see it from close proximity and also measure the emissions that come from the sun. So emissions like electrically charged particles and also magnetic fields that get dragged away from the sun. And so the mission that we're working on at the moment is called Solar Orbiter. And this is a model of one of the instruments that we're building. So we're involved in two aspects. One is a camera that's going to look at the sun in extreme ultraviolet light, so a wavelength that our eyes can't see, but which the sun shines very well in. And then this is an instrument which will sit in those solar emissions and measure the particles directly. And this one in particular is going to be measuring electrons, so negatively charged particles. So this is one of the models in a sequence of models that we make so that we make sure we've tested them, that they're robust and that they're going to survive in the extreme space environment. And Solar Orbiter is a really interesting mission because it gets so close to the sun that the sun facing side of the spacecraft will heat up to around 600 degrees Celsius. So the spacecraft has to be protected from the heat the instruments have to be protected from the heat and it's a really challenging mission for the engineers um, but you can see uh, the details this is a model of the inside of one of the sensors that's actually sitting in this compartment here um, it's made out of aluminium which is typically what we would make the instruments from so this mission will launch in 2018 and solar orbiter will be the closest spacecraft we've ever had to the Sun in terms of um, spacecraft that take images of the Sun. So we're going to have a completely new view. So this place is full of surprises and I'm going to take you to another quirky aspect of this department which is a facility that we built to contact our satellites and our instruments. And here we have it, this is our station to contact the instruments that we have on some of the satellites we work with. Looking for radio signals from other advanced civilizations is something that is, is actually happening in research. And my personal view is that it's a long shot, but we should be doing it. And actually this antenna here it illustrates really why we think that way. So this is a facility that we can use to send and receive signals from spacecraft so we can communicate with them but the bigger picture is that because we use radio waves to contact spacecraft we use radio waves also to listen or to, uh, to broadcast radio stations and TV stations all the time we're sending this information out into the universe or at least into the galaxy so the idea is that if we're doing that other civilizations might be able to pick up our radio signals that propagate away from the earth and perhaps vice versa, we could pick up radio signals that they're sending out, either on purpose or accidentally as we are. But it's a big sky out there. So it's like finding a needle in a haystack if indeed life does exist anywhere else in our galaxy. But it's a tantalising thought that one day the signals we send out might be picked up and that one day we might find evidence of advanced civilizations through their radio signals. The big questions that I'm interested in are to do with the sun's dynamic side and in particular 
related to um, a phenomenon called a coronal mass ejection. So it's not a phrase that rolls off the tongue and it's not a phrase I think that's particularly well known, but these events are huge eruptions that take place from the sun's atmosphere, blasting the same mass as a mountain into the solar system at speeds of maybe up to 2,000 kilometres a second. So personally, I'm interested in where does the energy come from to power these events? What are the physical processes that trigger them and drive them? I think there are so many interesting things about the sun and questions that are still to be answered. Many of them focus on the sun's magnetic field. So it is a magnetic object and it has this interesting and variable magnetic field on different size scales and also different time scales as well. But I think the interesting thing is that the magnetic field acts as a reservoir for energy in the sun's atmosphere. So it's able to power all these interesting um, phenomena in the sun's atmosphere. And so there's a big push to try and understand how is the magnetic field uh, formed? How does it evolve? And, and how does it shed the energy that ultimately builds up in it? I think the favorite thing about my line of work is working with PhD students. I really enjoy teaching them, but I really enjoy the questions they have. And I like the fact that they challenge you as well. So there's an aspect that to really explain something, you have to really understand it. And they won't let that go. You know, if you don't explain it properly, they'll push. So it benefits myself to work with students. And I'm also interested in making sure that we have the continuity of researchers coming through as well, so that the questions that I'm working on at the moment will lead to future questions and we need young scientists to come in and answer them. And also on the engineering side, on the mission side, the missions that we're building now are large, they're ambitious, and they take long time scales to come to fruition. So we need future generations of scientists to work on the missions. So for example, the Solar Orbiter mission that we're building at the moment will launch around 2018. It will go into orbit around the sun. It will get to the right orbit around 2021 then its orbit will evolve and it will have several years after that where we're collecting data. Now, there are, there'll be future missions beyond that as well. And we, we need to make sure that there'll be scientists who are trained up to use those data sets and, and make the most of them. When it comes to the male-female ratio in science, I think it varies by area. So for my area in astrophysics, my personal experience, and I think from looking at the numbers, is that we're not doing too badly. I think at the senior levels, there's an underrepresentation of women. So if you're looking at female professors, but actually in my group, in my department, we're, we're pretty good. So we have three female professors in the solar group. Um, in fact, all our staff members are female in the solar group, so we're dominating here. But then when you look at younger areas, the trend is that you have more representation of women as you go to lower um, or younger ages. So my hope is that as they progress through their careers, the gender balance will improve in the years to come. But it's still an issue that needs talking about, and it's still an issue that needs awareness. And if we could go back into the school system, for example, and look at how many girls are doing physics at school. And I think when it's compulsory science at GCSE levels, the, the gender balance is good. But as soon as you then start selecting in A-levels, the gender balance in physics, I mean here, becomes pretty bad. So I think it's around 20% of A-level students are female. And we certainly have a difference between whether girls will choose to do physics if they're at an all-girls school or if they're at a co-ed school. So girls are much more likely to choose to do A-level physics if they're in a single-sex school. So I personally would like to see the number of girls doing physics rise. They're capable, they're interested, but there's just something happening there that means that they ultimately don't choose to take physics. So I think my sort of overall point is that we don't have gender equality in terms of numbers in my area or in physics in general, but there is a concerted effort to raise awareness of that issue and encourage girls who are interested in doing physics to do so.